What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns. I'm Noah, and as always, I'm joined by my man, Mike, at Mike Me Up on Twitter. How are you doing today, Mike? What up? Excited to be here, man. It's going to be exciting times. Combine's here. Let's get it. Hey, and guys. Today, we're joined by a very friendly guest. Some guys, <laughs> some of you guys may know him. He goes by the name of Nick. He actually owns this channel. Uh, how are you doing today, Nick? I'm good. I'm, I'm uh, really excited that you guys accepted my plea, my begging to get back onto the show. Uh, they were hesitant at first. They think I've gone too far out of the trenches. I'm not a, I'm not a numbers guy anymore. I'm a, I'm a top level guy. I see what they're doing over here on the show. They're putting out arguably the best dynasty content on the web. And I was like, fuck, I need to get my clout back in the dynasty game. So I'm back here. We're going to have a good app. I'm excited. Let's fucking do this, boys. Yeah, and today we're just talking about the combine, things that we don't care about, like hand size, things that we do care about, <laughs> like fat running backs running slow. It's not going to last long. We're going to cut it off short. Nick, I'll let you do the honors. What time is it? It's fucking intro time, baby. All right, man. So we just got a lot of the measurements today. You know, obviously everyone's getting hype because there's no information. And when there's no information, people like to grasp onto whatever they can, you know, call it hand sizes, dick sizes. It doesn't matter, man. People <laughs> just grasp on anything. So today we're here to talk about like what, what, how we approach it. So what do we think is important? What noise to fade? You know, if so-and-so benches 25 reps, literally nobody cares. Uh, bench press is the most useless combine activity. Animal cares. Animal definitely cares. I was about to say, uh, on last week's Fade the Public, Animal said he crossed Christian McCaffrey off of his board <laughs> <laughs> because he only repped like eight bench presses. All right. Well, I mean, if you guys have seen uh, Animal's like, what is it? His physique. Uh, his is his, no, no, Animal's a tank. He's a physique. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sour on Animal's physique here. I'm just gonna sour on the fact that uh, Animal might not know what he's talking about in terms of combine. Yeah, don't metrics. go by Animal's dynasty rankings. We'll put it yeah, that way. Yeah, don't go by his bets either, unless you want to mortgage the house. <laughs> um, so I don't know. Let's kick it off here. I'll give you a real brief intro of how I approach the combine, and then obviously we'll get Noah and and Big Dog Nick's thoughts as well. Personally, I think the combine is a little bit overrated. Um, if you just look at what matters and what translates into fantasy production. A lot of the stuff that happens in the combine just like really doesn't matter at all. I mean, the only thing that matters is the fact that if you're a running back, you got to be big and fast because that means you get draft capital and you get opportunity. Um, but for wide receivers, like 40 times really doesn't matter. If you actually look at the stats, like if you look at the second round wide receivers, you would have actually done better by picking the slower ones over the faster ones over the last few years. So that just kind of goes to show there's a lot of noise in there. I use it as a negative eliminator. What I mean by that is if I really like someone going in and then they go into the combine and they pull a David Montgomery or Devin Singletary and run like a 4 seven forty, that guy tumbles down my draft boards. But let's say, you know, someone like, for example, a Brandon Ayuk, who I don't like already, and he goes to the combine, he runs a 4-4 four, four or a 4-3-5 or whatever. I'm just like not really going to care. Like how do you guys think about the different – Con concepts of the combine how do you weight those things yeah building off of what you said like quarterbacks what really matters there they take a wonder look test that doesn't matter at all they get their hand size measured which doesn't matter at all we just learned that nick's hands are bigger than basically everybody in this class <laughs> and nick nick was like a very prolific high school quarterback but I i'm not gonna i'm not gonna weigh the size of somebody's hand from their thumb to their pinky that highly because you know joe burrow comes in with a size nine inch hand or whatever the dude just it makes, threw it makes 50, absolutely no fucking sense he that threw he 55 can, touchdowns in college. It doesn't, his hand didn't magically shrink from then. And I know the ball is different, but he's still an insane quarterback. And if you look at the top clapped back on Twitter, yeah, he, he said something about like he's not gonna be able to he, throw a football now, it's gonna slip out of his hands every time he like drops back. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah, and I was looking at the top 12 quarterbacks this past year, Nick or Mike, whichever. Guess who has nine and one fourth inch hands? Russell Wilson, Baker Mayfield. <laughs> No. Drew Brees. Tyler? Patrick Mahomes has nine oh. and one-fourth inch hands. Uh, Ryan Tannehill had, had nine inch hands. So if you're looking at hand size as like an eliminator, I wouldn't, unless it's like below nine, I saw that no quarterback has below nine inch hands other than Brandon Allen. We saw how that experiment went. But I don't think anybody other than Fromm had below nine inch hands. So yeah, as Mike was saying, for quarterback, it really doesn't matter. Running backs, basically speed, burst. That's all that really matters, their athleticism and their draft capital, which if they test well, the draft capital will come. 
And if you want to check out BigDogsFantasy.com, I wrote an article about how the combine can maybe help you pick out some certain running backs. But we'll obviously know the guys like Dobbins and Taylor and Swift. Those are going to be guys with high draft capital and are going to test well. But just looking at that test that I did, it's guys who tested in the 60th percentile in speed score and burst score, as well as being a top three round pick. So basically, opportunity and athleticism. Of the guys in the sample, 78.9% became a running back three at least once in their career. 68% became a running back two. And 53% became a running back one. So it's, it's pretty intuitive. Like if you're a good athlete and a team picks you highly to use you, you're going to be good in the league. Um, as for wide receiver, again, I don't really care. The only thing that really matters is breakout age and opportunity. And tight ends just be fast. And unless you're Zach Ertz, that really doesn't matter. Yeah, I think around this time of the year, it's like it's important. What, what Mike said, you know, the combine is overrated in some senses. People are just dying to, to find any sort of information to make a take around it. And at this time of the year where there's absolutely nothing going on, the combine is obviously the biggest event. And one of the, you know, one of the things as you, as you play dynasty year in and year out, one of the things you'll quickly learn is that draft capital pretty much trumps, you know, 99% of the things that come with athletic testing and even like college production to a sense, because coaches will keep shoving their guys that they drafted in the top three rounds. If you're a day two pick, that's so much more important than running a sub four or five forty or whatever. So what a lot of the combine does is that if a player tests well, that doesn't necessarily mean like, oh, he's athletic. He's going to be good in the NFL. What it means is that gives the player a higher chance to get drafted at a higher spot, which in turn, you know, ends up translating into more play time, more opportunities, probably more efficiency overall, because they'll keep giving him volume in that sense. So um, in terms of the testing, yeah, I mean, you hit it on, on it from like an analytical standpoint with running backs is kind of like the speed score, because it's still telling you relative to other athletes that are on the NFL field. Like what, like I, I texted you guys the, um, the Instagram DM I got uh, a few hours ago from this kid. He was like, yo, check out this, this running back for Monmouth. And I have no idea about the kid. He might be like a baller ass running back, but listen, when you're playing at Monmouth, the competition level is going to be subpar. So what the combine does is tell you that like, okay, is this kid really good? Cause he's playing against Monmouth competition or is he actually on par with NFL athletics, right? That's when he runs the 40. And if he's like a four, six, five guy, you're like, okay, he was probably good because he was playing against Monmouth, but if he comes in and runs a four, four, then you're like, okay, well he went to Monmouth, but he still has legit NFL speed. So again, I, I mean, I, you guys touched on it, but like it, it, it's a measuring stick. It is not uh, the end all be all by any means, but I think it's a lot of people just grasping on to numbers that we're finally getting. Cause we haven't had shit in like two months now, you know? Yeah, yeah. man, dude, information, uh, information scarcity, dude. People just want to talk about shit, you know? It's yeah, the combine is basically just a way for NFL evaluators to move guys up their boards. And then that in turn gives them opportunity, like you said. And for wide receivers, I was looking at different factors that could impact their finish. Uh, this past year, 10 of 12 wide receivers inside the top 12 were actually day two or earlier picks. 20 of the top 24 were day two or earlier picks. And 31 out of the top 36 receivers were day two or earlier picks. And the top 12, the only outliers were Julian Edelman and Tyree Kill. And those are obviously guys who, like Julian Edelman, cemented himself in that offense. And Tyree Kill is just a one-of-a-kind freak. So if you're really shooting for these guys, don't try and get guys in the I floor. mean, just, just look back to last year, right? There was a lot of guys that most of us didn't really know coming into the year. But if they were in round three or earlier, like the Terry McLaurins and, and those guys, there was a lot of guys that were way more highly touted. You know, the Hakeem Butlers and the Andy Isabellas that we all liked, but you know, if, if a guy's going into a weird situation or weird draft capital or whatever, the, the tiebreaker there should be where they ended up going in the, uh, in the NFL draft. I know Andy Isabel actually went earlier than that, but the, the point remains, you know, there's a lot of guys that you're going to like just based off athletic testing. You see them going around four, five, six, seven, start to pull back, objectively start to pull back on those guys. Yeah, Calvin Harmon, uh, caution, to, yeah. caution to the wise. That guy was a top five consensus dynasty wide receiver rookie. And he went into the sixth round, and I immediately moved him off my draft boards because opportunities came in. Yeah, like guys like Johnson's going to fall down that same path, and I'm not, I'm not living yeah. that truth yet. But in a few months, I'm going to have to move him down my boards. Yeah, that's kind of a good segue. I wanted to kind of get both your thoughts on a couple of players that you think have the biggest potential to either rise up in value or crash down in value uh, coming out of the combine. For me, Noah, what are you first? I think. I think for each position, if you just want to run through one each, uh, I think Jordan Love, he came in with like 10 and a half inch hands. That's obviously a big, big dick. <laughs> hey, <laughs> calm down. Uh, that's obviously a big factor nowadays, I guess. All he has to do is look good in shorts and run like a 4.8, and he's basically Josh Allen 2.0. Uh, 
Um, a, a lot of the other guys like Jalen Hurts, we know he's going to be fast. If he tests slow, just like a Henry Ruggs, if he tests slow, it's not like we think that they're slow, right? They probably just had a bad day. We've, they've clocked in at like 24 miles an hour. Uh, another running back I think that could rise up boards, and he's a little-known guy out of Appalachian State, it's Darrington Evans. Watching this guy play, he's pretty versatile. He was a kick returner, and he scored uh, a kick return touchdown every single year. He ran for, like, over 1,200 yards. He's a freak athlete. Player, prof player profiler has him at, like, 5'11", 190. Everywhere, everywhere else has him at 200 pounds, so I'm not so sure exactly where his BMI stacks up. But if he runs in the 4'4s, I could see him moving up not only NFL draft boards, but people's rankings for fantasy football. And as for wide receiver, you put it on Twitter. I think Donovan Peoples-Jones, he's somebody who, when I watched him play, he didn't necessarily look too athletic. He wasn't making guys miss after the catch. He wasn't even that great on punt returns, despite being Michigan's punt returner. But coming out of high school, I guess he ran a 4-4, and he, ran, he had a 40-inch vertical. So he seems to be a freak athlete. I'm not so sure how highly I, I weigh that, because Miles Boykin had a very similar situation last year where I wasn't a fan. He was very athletic, and we saw what happened with him. But I think those are three guys uh, that could rise after the combine just because of their athletic testing. Yeah. What about you, Nick? So I'm, I'm looking at, I mean, I, I mainly use the combine for running backs because, again, I want to see that speed score. For wide receivers, I'm intrigued by this. This class is such a, uh, like a funky class in terms of the, the wide receivers are so deep and so much talent, but it's, it's like very versatile talent. I feel like there's six guys that remind me of Debo Samuel, but it's just like, if you're in Madden, like all they're doing is just like adjusting like the weight and height. They're just like scrolling up and down, but they still have the same skill set as Debo. So I'm not really concerned about those guys. I want to see how the taller, uh, more lean guys run like uh, T Higgins, uh, Denzel Mims, um, Justin Jefferson, guys like that and, and see where they kind of, you know, I don't, think that the speed score is necessarily huge for the, for guys that high but I think some of those guys that might be around the same range like the Jefferson versus the Denzel Mims in that range you know if one of them runs like a four or five and one of them runs like a four seven two or some shit like that that could be a tiebreaker between those two right they're both like very talented and you like both of them but that's something I could be looking forward to for running backs I'm looking at these these thicker running backs the fat boys over there particularly uh I think Zach Moss is definitely a guy that everyone kind of wants to keep the eye on because we see that he has such good like tackle breaking prowess and usually um those guys have some kind of flaw in their game and for him it's you know you, I mean the lesser competition is going to be a thing but if he could be an actual athlete if he could have a high speed score he's going to shoot up boards and I could see him competing I already have him in my top five for running back rankings but I could see him if he ends up running somehow blows into the, the you know a four or five or like below then which I don't think is going to happen but if he, you know if he's in that range I think that's gonna be really good news I also like the kid Michael Warren out of Cincinnati. Um, what concerns me about him is obviously Cincinnati was in the American conference, which is not a power five conference. And he only averaged 4.8 yards per carry this year. So you're like, yeah, he's out of the power five. It's not doing well efficiency wise, but I'm looking a little bit deeper into the numbers and, and thank you to uh, sports info solutions for the advanced metrics that they're giving us access to over there. I'm trying to figure out like, cause I'm watching Michael Warren. I'm like, this kid's a beast. He can make room for himself. He could break tackles and stuff. 4.8 yards per carry and yards after contact per attempt was 3.4 so the difference there 1.4 yards from what he created and his overall yards per carry was the 11th highest among all running backs that had like 110 carries or something so it was like the 11th highest delta of yards after contact to yards per carry of like 150 running backs so i'm like he's creating on his own his broken tackle rate was good he was catching balls finally this year so if someone his size right both of these guys have workhorse size like 5 10 5 11 220 pounds that's what you need for an nfl running back if you want to be a three down skill set guy both of them caught passes as well so if they could show me something in the in the in the speed score section man i'm going to be really high on both of these guys yeah that, that makes a ton of sense and really like what you did there to break down the yards per carry guys if you're using yards per carry to measure running back success, don't do it. It's like one of the most noisy and shittiest stats out there. Like you want to look back at to like break it board. down. Yeah, go back to the drawing board, man. Because like if you're gonna come to me and tell me like, oh, running back X is like not good because they have a low res per carry, I'm gonna be like, it doesn't really matter because if anything, yards per carry is Sounds more personal. attributable to offensive line than it is to running back. You like, said it I sounds think, personal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I'm. It's the other thing too. It, it's really tough for college because there's obviously a lot 
less or a lot fewer sources to go off of like efficiency metrics and advanced metrics because yeah. right now i mean what do you guys personally use for offensive line is, is football outsiders the only thing we can use that's all i use yeah yeah because cincinnati i mean i'm seeing those numbers from michael warren i'm like there's obviously a disconnect between how good he is and how good the offensive line is but i looked at the numbers from football outsiders and they're like 30th or 33rd out of 130 so i'm like they were pretty good but that doesn't take into effect um you know, it's not that those weren't all Michael Warren's carries. Those could have been backup running backs carries too. But I mean, I'm like, there's definitely like a little bit of a delta there. I, I wish there were more like really good advanced metric sources that we could use for offensive line, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's not perfect. Um, I mean, yeah. the way I the thing I wait for, and I know you wait for it too, is Graham Barfield's yards created. That's probably like, you know, the Bible when it comes to running backs and what I look at come for college prospects. I wish you but, did more. Yeah, dude, totally. He, he, but like, I understand why he doesn't because he probably has a grind like hundreds and hours of tape just to get that data out. But also like, you know, it doesn't take into account like conference and like competition. I think like in college, if you have a dominant offensive line, like the gap is so much wider yeah. than in the NFL, right? Like if you have like, you know, Ohio State, Wisconsin, like some of these teams that are going out and like, even if they're facing like, you know, top 20 competition, top 20 defenses, the gap is still so wide that the advantage is in their favor. So it's just a lot of noise. So I would, I'd really be careful with using stuff like that. Um, personally, for me, though, I mean, I just want to touch briefly on Tyler Johnson. He's decided not to run because he needs more time to prep. I mean, if he goes out on his pro day and runs a 4-7, it's not good, boys. He's, no. he's, falling, he's falling into the fifth round, and I'm moving him down my draft board. Brian Edwards, god damn it, this motherfucker hurt his foot. I was surprised you guys kept him that high, uh, you know, higher. And, and at, later on in the episode, we're going to uh, unveil some of our rankings for it. And uh, that, that's a huge red flag for me, man. I know it's not really – it's probably yeah. not a long-term concern, but it's the fact that now uh, a lot of the numbers are still going to be hidden. Like, we're never going to really know, you know, what he yeah. did in the combine. Yeah, I mean, I dropped him a full tier. Of rookie wide receivers getting hurt and producing right after. Like, Mike Williams is one that comes to mind. I'm pretty sure Josh Doxson entered the year hurt, and they just never broke out. I mean, Mike Williams had a few good seasons, but he never really reached his peak because that whole first off season with the team was wasted with a broken back. The same might be the case for Brian Edwards, even if he's a high draft pick. It's going to take a while for, like, for him to produce and for him to grow chemistry with whoever picks him. Yeah, I mean, I dropped him a full tier. So that was a big move for me. Um, but when you get into that down, down area, like he still has like a sick analytics profile and he was productive. So, you know, I'm hoping that some of that Debo magic comes off too as the teams look for that next Debo, that next, you know, in-space playmaker. But man, I'm scared, dude. I'm scared for Edwards. I'm scared for Johnson. In terms of big risers, I think that Brandon Ayuk could be a big riser. I'm still out on him. So if you have shares why, of Brandon Ayuk. Why are you out other than, is it just the breakout age? Yeah, it's the fact that he basically did nothing until his senior year. And, like, he's not really facing, like, elite competition. And, like, he didn't even show up to the senior bowl and, like, dominate. He's just, like, I mean, there's nothing on his tape that really tells me that he's going to succeed. And there's nothing in the analytics that tells me he's going to succeed. Like, it was usually guys that take that long to produce. It's because you're now older and you're basically a man competing against boys. So it's expected for you to produce at that level. Yeah, and I, he, I think my argument for, for IU – in particular would be i mean i think he spent the first two years at like juco out of college that was in arizona state his first yep. year he transfers over and Nikhil harry is taking you know 35 percent of the the targets on that offense so this is the first year he finally got i totally get what you're saying like obviously your senior year breakout is a huge red flag but i think you know he's extremely versatile like he's someone that could play the debo role like he's someone that he doesn't excel off of he almost reminds me of this is definitely a stretch, but like he reminds me of Juju in terms of like his skill set. He's not someone that could beat uh, press coverage a lot on the outside, but he's extremely versatile. And if you use him as a slot flanker, like he's going to run a really good 40. He was really good at like kick, kick return and punt return. So he's got the versatility. So in my eyes, I guess there definitely are red flags, but there, there gets to a point for me where some of the pros start to outweigh the big red flags, or at least, you know, it gives him a chance. Yeah, that's totally fair. And I just would have loved to see him produce a bit with Harry. You know, I understand that Harry's going to take yeah. 35%, but there's still 65% of the market share and a bunch of scrubs on the team. Like, when you have two really good players, they should still both produce. And he just didn't really show up at all. So that's my, my main concern. But like I said, if he goes out and runs like a 4-3, low 4-4, four, four, he's got the size. Like, he's going to shoot up draft capital in terms of NFL. So you can't really ignore him. Yeah, another guy like that is Devin Duvernay out of Texas. He didn't really produce until his final season as well. And you look at the competition he faced, it was little Jordan Humphrey and Colin Johnson on his own team, a bunch of really tall guys that aren't very fast. But he was actually on the outside until his senior year, until little Jordan Humphrey vacated that role. And that's when he really broke out. And if you look at the data hub or whatever, the, the stats that Nick was referring to, 
for Michael Warren. If you look at Devin DuVernay's numbers out of the slot, I believe since 2016, he has the most slot yards behind only Trent Taylor. He had a ton of broken tackles, a bunch of yards after the catch. So along with Brandon Ayuk, Devin DuVernay is a guy who I hope when he gets drafted, whatever offensive coordinator has him, uses him out of the slot instead of putting him on the outside just because he's going to run a 4-3 or 4-4. They expect him to be a deep threat. I think using a guy like that in that Debo role, you know, breaking tackles, using him in the short game, manufacturing touches for him is going to be huge. But then again, you have to weigh a lot. You have to put a lot of faith in whoever drafts him, uh, using him correctly. And I'm, I'm just not so, so sure that, you know, a bunch of these other guys who are more versatile and who have shown that they can produce both on the outside and on the inside uh, don't belong in front of him because of that. Yeah. You know what's something I, I think I'm going to do? Yeah, I, I think what I'm going to do is look at, because I was going back, you know, I was looking at some of the guys who are like really big on, on broken tackles this year from the wide receiver point of view. I think what I'm going to start doing and targeting in later rounds is I'm going to, you know, pick a group of offensive coordinators or head coaches that I think are really good, you know, like the Kyle Shanahan's of the world, and then kind of cross-reference if they draft wide receivers that are really high in broken tackle rate, you know, like putting really yeah. good players in good positions. I think those are like good kind of dart throws at the end of your rookie draft. So make sure you're following us on Twitter because I think I'm going to be tweeting out, you know, leaders in terms of like broken tackles from the wide receiver position this year. And because going back, I look at like 2018, I looked at 2017, and I feel like from that point of view, like taking that strategy – uh, was a, a pretty good hit rate. I can't really think of too many off the top of my head, but I remember like the Debo's and, and like those kind of guys it were always like at the Jill top. Jalen Hurd and Dante Pettis as well, who are who are good after the catch. Hell yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah, it's gonna no, be I, a hit and miss in the third and fourth round of the rookie drafts. You know, it's it's tough to get those guys right, but I think putting yourself in the best you know position to to try to hit. Yeah, no, for sure. That's gonna be some dope analysis. I'm looking forward to that one. My last big riser, you know who it is, Cam Makers, my boy. I think like you know he's already up there in the top five. But I think that this combine is going to be a little bit of his breaking out party. Like similar, do you guys remember last year? Like nobody was talking about Miles Sanders before the combine, right? Like he was at Penn State. He was just another running back. Then he went to the combine, smashed it in a complete unathletic class, and he became a second round pick, right? And obviously this class is way more athletic, but I don't think people know how athletic Cam Akers is yet. And when he goes and runs like a 4-4, has like a you know 80th, 90th percentile speed score, burst and all that stuff, I think he's going to shoot up draft boards as well. When you said 4-4, yeah, are you talking about his 40 this? time or his yards per carry? Sorry? Real, real quick, it's, uh, we're filming this on Monday night, so running backs haven't weighed in or anything, so we don't know the height and weight of any of these guys. We only know the wide receivers. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm just looking off, uh, going off memory what I see on tape. But, yeah, it's going to be exciting, man. Get, get hyped, guys. The next so part, do you think, can't really see his hold on real quick. On tape so, either because he's running behind a terrible offensive line. He doesn't have the opportunity to break away a lot of carries. You, you see him get the ball. And there's like five linebackers right in his face right away. And he has to create everything for himself. And I know, Mike, you got a little, a little testy about this. But it, it's really true when you watch him play. He really had, no, he had nothing to work with. Yet he still produced very well both in the receiving game and on the ground. If he tests well at the combine, I don't see how he doesn't move up draft boards and how he doesn't sneak his way into that top three mix for dynasty running backs. So the way I look at it right now, and I think this is probably the way a lot, a lot of people look at it that aren't really – uh, maybe in it as, as far as we are right now, I would say Cam Akers is probably the consensus for right now, right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, sir. What, what, what numbers do you think he needs to put up at the combine for him to be a, to, for him to move into the consensus top three or two? If he runs a four, four, like he's in a shoot. It. If he runs a four, four and he like tests well in terms of like his burst, uh, I think like that's really all you need. Like I know he's strong, so he's going to put up like mad weights, but literally that doesn't fucking matter. But if he runs a four, four, like it's gonna be, it's gonna be lights out. So that's not gonna be a surprise, really, for you at all. I don't think so, because when I watch him on tape, like I think he's that fast. I think he's like you know the low like four three like around that area. So and then if he burst, if he tests out on the burst, like I said, I've seen him hit the edges pretty quickly. So say all these, the say all four of these guys: Taylor, Dobbins, Swift, Acres, all run a four four three. Where where are you ranking them? They all run a four four three. Every one of them runs a four four three straight up. Um, even Swift, I don't expect Swift to All run a four four three. Every I mean, if Swift, one if Swift runs a four four three, I'm gonna have to reconsider. Uh, I'm gonna have to reconsider moving him back up my one point one. Did you do it, something, Noah? It just said we got a gift and it removed our forty minute time limit. Yeah, it said the meeting has been upgraded by the host. I hope they didn't. Do you have a credit card on file? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm leaving this in the Whatever. video. The behind the scenes of making totally it. worth it. Yeah, leave that <laughs> yeah. shit in. All right, yeah. So say. The, my point is, like, you know, if, if Akers, Akers is probably going to be one of the better athletes of the four, but say they're all, like, equally athletic, um, 
and it doesn't give Acres an advantage anywhere. How do you rank these guys? I mean, I probably just still have it where I have it now. It's just uh, JT yeah. Swift, Acres, Dobbins. That's how I'd have it. I would, I'd only move Acres down if he tests noticeably worse than like a Dobbins or a Taylor. I currently have Swift, Taylor, Acres, Dobbins. We'll get into it more later. But if Acres runs like a four six somehow, and Dobbins does test in the four fours. It's going to be hard to keep Acres ahead of Dobbins just because of that disparity in athleticism mm-hmm. and the eventual draft capital. Yeah, for okay. sure. Okay. All I just right. want to put that, you on the spot. That's a good segue. We're going to hit up the first release of the Big Dogs rookie rankings, and uh, we'll kind of throw some of these rankings on screen, and you're going to see the ADP per DLF latest February mock drafts, and then you're going to see the Big Dog ranking, and then you're going to see the individual breakups between Nick, Noah, and myself, so you get a good, good shot of that. And we'll kind of start off with QBs. We're not going to spend too much time here because, it's I mean, it's pretty cut and dry. Honestly, I don't give a shit about anyone past Burrow and Burrow and Tua. Uh, I don't know how you guys are doing, but, um, yeah. I mean, we'll put that on screen real quick, and we'll just talk through it real quick. One thing I would – one thing I, I do want to uh, just touch on real quick, I want to get your guys' opinion on because I'm curious. And I feel like I've, I've seen a lot of super flex mock drafts. Like, people in the industry do uh, a lot of mock drafts right now. And the first round is is almost always – like Joe Burrow to a 101, 102. My, my question is like, I, I don't, maybe it's not a question, but my statement would be like, I don't think quarterbacks necessarily need to be ranked that high because the way I look at it is this. If you believe this is a really good running back class, right? Like if you think DeAndre Swift's going to be the next Dalvin Cook, he's like a top five startup pick. Or even if he's not, right? Like I'm still probably not taking a quarterback in a super flex dynasty startup unless you're Mahomes or Lamar Jackson in the first round otherwise it's probably it's kind of sifting back to the end of the second round so like for people to start taking Justin Herbert over like a fucking J.K. Dobbins or something I think is like completely ignorant and so people exaggerate it you know what I mean like and I don't even think you know unless you think Tua is legitimately the next like Russell Wilson and you're like pretty damn sure of it I'm taking a running back over most of these guys yeah, dude, I, I totally agree with you. I think people overvalue quarterbacks in general, not just in rookie drafts, right? Even in startup drafts, unless you're playing in a 14-team team league. I don't know if you guys ever played in one, but if you play in a 14-team team league and you wait on quarterback, you're uh, you are totally fucked, okay? Yeah. So, so that's why, like, people, I look at it like if you're doing a startup draft right now, like, would you actually be taking fucking Tua over DeAndre Swift? Like, I don't think you would. So why would, why would you do that in a rookie startup, a rookie, rookie draft? Yeah, no. So, I, I mean, I kind of battle this a lot. I think what it comes down to for me is, like, that's where you kind of get into team needs, right? If you're desperate for a quarterback, that's yeah. where you kind of got to you gotta fire the bullet because trying to acquire a quarterback outside of the draft is really, really expensive. And I think the reason why people draft quarterbacks early is because they have such a low hurdle to clear to have value. Like, you literally just need to start, right? Yeah. Whereas, like, you know, we love Swift, we love Taylor, we love Dobbins, but – they could turn into Rashad Penny, right? They could turn into Geis. They could turn into Dave Montgomery, and their value kind of plummets a little bit. So for me, it comes down to a need thing. So, I mean, at the 1.01, I'm glad that the consensus view is that, hey, you got to take Burrow because in super right. flex drafts, I love sitting at the 1.03. I love sitting at the 1.04 and coming out with, like, Jonathan Taylor and Jacob Dobbins or, you know, what have you, right? Yeah, That's I also I mean, think the it's... trade value of those top two quarterbacks is huge, which is a big reason why people take it. If they're not able to move that 101, you take Joe Burrow, you wait a couple months, and you look at the guy who is lacking a second quarterback, you move that for a running back. I also think, as Mike said, having that 103 is huge because you either get a DeAndre Swift or you get one of the quarterbacks that falls to you, which eventually has more trade value than one of these running backs or any of these receivers. So I think it's just a value play. And if I do have the 101 and I don't need a quarterback, package that for like the 105 or 106 and get a ton in return because people are extremely excited about Joe Burrow Let's not forget he's walking into Cincinnati. Actually, he might not be walking into Cincinnati. But Cincinnati, when's the last time they've had any type of good culture? I know Andy Dalton isn't great, but they haven't really fostered any type of winning mentality. Uh, he could be decent for fantasy, I guess, but it's not, it's not a perfect situation for him there. Whereas if DeAndre Swift lands in a Kansas City or a Seattle or a San Francisco, why would you pass on him at the 101? As Nick was saying, in a startup draft, if we knew that Swift was in one of those landing spots, He's probably, you know, a two or a second or third round pick. Whereas quarterbacks going in that range are like Deshaun Watson, Kyler Murray. You really think Joe Burrow is as good as those guys and you're willing to make that bet? I wouldn't. Yeah. So I mean, like I, if, Swift, if one of these running backs goes in the first round this year of the NFL draft, like they're 100% a, a first or second round pick in, in startup drafts. No, no, totally. 100%. I mean, they're, they're, already, they're already like second round startup picks, guys like JT exactly. and Swift. Um, so I think, I think you bring up a good point though. Like 
what I see it is like, this is where tears comes into play, right? So I have Tua and Burrow in my tier one and I have Justin mm-hmm. Herbert in my tier three. I skipped tier two because I don't think there's any tier two quarterbacks. Uh, but like, I would never take any of my tier one or tier two running backs behind Justin Herbert. That's just not how I'm going to yeah. do it. Like, but I also wouldn't let him fall past the first round. I think that's where I draw the line because even if you don't like a quarterback, like I hated Josh Allen, I hated Daniel Jones, but I still always took him in the first round just because they give you, you get a that- floor. The, the quarterbacks give you a floor, but like yeah. to and at the end of the first round for rookie drafts, yeah, a lot of the time you're just like shooting for guys that you think you like. But the later you get into those rookie drafts, the back of the first half, like the the more chance it is to miss on those players. So I understand because quarterbacks have such a good floor. That's why people like to take them so much. But at the beginning of the rookie draft, I'm looking for those fucking elite guys that take your team to the next level, you know? Totally agree. I think the one name we'll cover real quick is just Jalen Hurts. So consensus ADP has him at uh, QB6. We have him at QB5. And the one that's before him in ADP is Jake Fromm. I'm going to put it out there. Jake Fromm just ain't it, man. Like for fantasy, (laughs) I'm just not going to invest in him. Like he's incredibly boring. Like, you know, he's got tiny Donald Trump hands, even though we don't care about hands, but I hate him. So I'm using it. Um, and he just, he just isn't exciting, man. Like he doesn't rush. So he's a po- he's a pure pocket passer. That's a huge red flag for me. And I think he's one of those cases where he could be like a better, uh, NFL quarterback than a fantasy quarterback. But what do you guys think? Yeah. For me, when it comes down to Jake Fromm, think about it from a fantasy perspective. How's he going to get you points? He's not going to run. He's not getting deep throws for touchdowns. He's going to be like Alex Smith without, le- uh, that's, that's kind of mean that I'm about to say that, but he's basically Alex Smith without legs. Um, I don't like how that came out. Uh, whereas with Jalen Hurts, at least he can run the ball. And if he's not a great passer, we see a bunch of quarterbacks in the league who aren't great passers. I know Lamar Jackson became a lot better, but even in his rookie year when he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, the dude was be like he was quarterback one just because he could run a ton. If Jalen Hurts lands in an offense with an OC that wants to use him as a dual threat quarterback, which if they do use him as a starter, they're going to have to because that's the biggest part of his game. Uh, he he could be very fantasy you know, friendly. And he definitely has a higher ceiling than from. And when it comes to floor, like if you're playing for floor in like a second or third round quarterback pick for me personally, that's not what I'm going for. I'm going for Hertz. Who's going to give me that upside. If he ever does take a starting job and maybe give you like 75% of what Lamar Jackson gave you as a rookie. And even then it's more than what from would ever give you. Yeah. I mean, at least Alex Smith can, can get his legs fixed, but Jalen Hurts, bro, 1300 rushing yards this year. Like beast in today's in today's NFL, like today's fantasy landscape, you don't even need to be a good thrower. Like you, we, I don't care if you like Josh Allen is so wildly inaccurate for the most part, but he's a fantastic fantasy quarterback. Like if Jalen Hurts is a starting quarterback in the NFL, he's gonna put you up like sixteen points a game, and he'll have those ceiling games because if you're a runner, that's all you need. So yeah, I'm looking for the ceiling. Once you get past the first, you know, that tier one of quarterbacks or even like the tier two or the Herberts, whatever, you know, into the second, third round of rookie drafts, like Jalen Hurts with the ceiling is, is the opposite of Jake Fromm. Jalen Hurts is it when you're looking at quarterbacks there. So, I mean, we don't know if he's going to be great as a thrower, but I mean, the kid's also a winner, bro. He's a baller. He's a winner. Like it's the same thing with like Deshaun Watson. People didn't really like him. You know, they had all these problems with him. But the guy proved over and over again against tough college competition that he can get it done. He's a winner. And that translated to the next level. And I feel like we can get some of that from Jalen Hurts. Yeah. No, to be clear, none of us are saying that Jalen Hurts is comparable to Lamar Jackson or Deshaun Watson. We're just saying that, like, at that point in the draft, like, I am. you shoot it for upside. I'll, I'll put my life on it. <laughs> all right. We just all right, we just kicked Nick down the channel. So, <laughs> for the rest of us. Uh, let's, move on to the, let's move on to the running backs. Um Everyone loves running backs. Uh, We'll throw up our rankings up there. The top five, I mean, really not much to say there. We have Dobbins two spots below, but that's just because me and Noah love Cam Akers, but they're all really in that same tier. It's going to come down to landing spot. Um, So I don't think there's too much to cover there. We got our boy Zach Moss coming in at number six. Nick has him in the top five. Tell us a little bit about your boy, man. Why do you love him so much? Um, I just think that he – brings a skill set that's there's not a lot of red flags there that you can really like prove you know like you could say it was against lesser competition but he he checked every box there's no boxes that he didn't check we have to wait for the athletics of course but for me it's it's like innocent until proven guilty so until he comes in and runs the four six two or whatever then i'll knock him down but for now extreme college production 
he has a knack for the end zone. He catches the he catches balls. We've seen by every elusive measure that he's a tackle breaker as well. He's not he might be big, right? He's got workhorse NFL size, but he's not a grinder because we see him make guys miss like there's no fucking tomorrow. So as soon as I put the film on, what I saw was Kareem Hunt. I was like, this is Kareem Hunt all over again. The guy's extremely elusive. So until there's a reason not to like him, he's gonna be up on my board. So you think he's closer to Kareem Hunt than David Montgomery? Yes. I think uh We'll see. Yeah, this is where the athletics, I think, are going to come in for me for a little bit, as well as the, the draft capital and the landing spot. Yeah, um, but what you see on film, because I, I remember when I watched Kareem Hunt, I could still see like the burst. Like when yeah. I saw him, he could hit a hole. When I saw David Montgomery, he looked like he was running in mud. He couldn't hit any holes. You're so. right. There was, there was a very big lack of burst from Montgomery. I see much more uh, Kareem Hunt to Zach Moss than I see David Montgomery. Yeah, that was my immediate comp was uh, Kareem Hunt. And then I put that on Twitter and Ray GQ is like, no, he's going to go with Jamal Williams. And then I just like, I haven't watched Zach Moss since because I don't want to see anything that looks like Jamal Williams. I, have Jamal, missed- I don't think Jamal Williams has fucking broken a tackle since he entered the NFL. <laughs> he definitely <laughs> does. It's nonsense. I, I totally understand the comp because that was actually, I, I think I told you this, that was like my, my second comp for him in terms of just like the way he was built and the physicality he brings to the game. But in terms of, like, elusiveness, like, Zach Moss shouldn't be that elusive at 220 pounds. You know how good Jamal Williams must feel that people are comping people to him? Like, I don't think Jamal <laughs> Williams true. ever expected his skill set to be like, compared to anybody. He just yeah. closes his eyes and runs. Like, Trent Richardson is probably the closest thing I've ever seen to him. Yeah, like, yeah. I'll, I'll be on the record saying I'm, I am completely okay being – not okay, but I'm completely preparing to be disappointed by what Zach Moss does at the Combine. But the fact that he is 220 pounds – he just needs to be, like, okay in the 40 for him to have a good speed score. Just a sub 4.6, man. That's all we're asking yeah, for. Exactly. Yeah, I remember last year you were a little disappointed in Devin Singletary because he ran a 4.6, but he was also, like, 5'8", like, 195 yeah. or whatever. Zach mm-hmm. Moss has two inches and, like, 30 pounds on him. So, yeah, I could totally see if he runs, you know, even a 4.6, his weight-adjusted speed score is going to be pretty high because even Kareem Hunt, who is, I think, a 4.62, had a decent yeah. enough speed score. Like, we saw here's that the thing. No one, no one thinks Zach Moss is going to test well. What happens if Zach Moss tests really well? The upper percentile of what he could pull off, he's going to be like top. He's going to be in that like almost Cam Akers category, I want, I want to say. No, 100%. 100%. You know what I mean? like, no there. one's thinking that's going to happen. But what if he comes in, runs like a fucking 4 5 two, His burst and acceleration are like both there. You know, like people are going to be like, okay, there's really no flaws with this game. I mean, PFF's going to take a fucking victory lap because they have Zach Moss as the running back one. Yeah, well, they did that with Demon too. So, yeah um next up let me call pirine i'm gonna hand over to Noah. i know this is your boy i i, I know that i learned about him through uh hearing from you so yeah he was my boy until i started to watch other running backs in this class i just like that he could catch passes and he reminded me a little bit of alvin kamara just in the sense that he wasn't a workhorse but he still looked good when he had the ball in his hands he isn't extremely elusive he isn't extremely fast but he's a good pass catcher he breaks a decent amount of tackles and he ran behind a pretty terrible offensive line at florida and went up against sec competition and every single year he was there he was basically the most productive running back he outproduced jordan scarlett which is saying next to nothing i guess but the fact that he could be used in the receiving game at least lends me to believe that if he is like a fourth or fifth round pick he could work his way into a roster b some sort of satellite back and if there's an injury he has the upside to take over a workhorse role for a couple weeks here and there and that's a decent enough fantasy value return that you can get in the late second or early third of a rookie draft yeah yeah we're a little bit higher on him we got him at rb9 consensus has him at rb12 but honestly like in that range i put him down i i, I kind of have a mouthful about about p ryan after watching him uh, i watched like three or four of his games today first thing i think the obvious comparison i you know what i think our job is as like people who you know come on and, and do podcasts and shit for most of the people that don't have until you really watch film of guys you have a hard time of connecting like who the players are right like you hear us talking about them all the time so i think our job is to kind of let the audience know what the overarching theme of a player is right and then you can kind of get into more context so for p ryan he's a guy who caught like what do you catch 40 balls this year 40 passes yep. yeah so that's an, an, an immense number for a college running back so he's a pass catching running back when we look six point six uh six point six yards per catch though let's just put that six, one out there yeah. so, so my problem with him is like I, I saw just so much james white in his game like that's what it was for me uh, uh for the last one. three years he has had like around 135 carries right and this yep. year their, their offensive line was terrible um last year was his good year where he averaged like six yards a carry on very limited sample but the offensive line was ranked like top 12 per football outsiders this year it dipped down and it was i have some numbers here because i was watching some of the film and he had this breakaway run against auburn where he ran it was an 88 yard touchdown run i was like damn okay um i looked at his numbers and he only ran for about 650 yards on the on the year so that 88 yard run was like 15 to 20 percent of his entire yardage williams and that 
yeah, but Damian Williams, like, has shown us that he has big playability all the time. Like, you never see this from P. Ryan. That was, like, his big run. And besides that, he's averaging, you know, I, I just don't think he's a good inside runner. M my point being is I don't think he's a good inside runner. He's not elusive in space. As you said, he's not that good. And I was looking at the broken tackle numbers. His, his broken tackle rate uh, per Info Solutions was very, very, very subpar. So th the problem with it being James White is, like, James White, basically for any pass catching running back, James White is basically your ceiling for fantasy football, right? But the majority of guys end up being Geos or Naeem Hines who are like better players for their actual teams and not for fantasy. So like I know Piron's going to end up going a little bit later in rookie draft, so you're not wasting a lot of capital on him. But my, my concern is that he's definitely not going to be an early down runner at the next level. So you're hoping at best he's James White. And I just like don't think it's smart to, to bank on a guy because he's I mean, he's smaller inside, not a, smaller in size, not a good uh, runner, in my opinion. So. Um, I just don't personally like him because the numbers back that up that he's not really elusive or a good runner either. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of on board with you. He's just kind of a jag to me. Um, but honestly, like in that range, there just isn't really that many choices. So you want to look for guys that can actually be involved in the pass catching game because yeah. at a bare minimum, they can get on the field, right? So I think that's kind of where we come out on P. Ryan. Next up, Michael Warren. Again, another one of Noah's dudes. Noah went on a detective mission earlier this year and found this dude's birthday by watching his Twitter. <laughs> Nobody had his birthday, but but Noah got it. So again, just Michael Warren and then happy birthday. And there's like some random girl. He's like, happy birthday, Michael. Have fun at Cincinnati. <laughs> I, assumed, I assumed he was like the same age as I was because he was in the same class as me. So yeah, we worked yeah. hard for that, but we got it. Yeah. What do you think about him? Uh, well, Nick already touched on it before. He went on the pro uh, info hub. And he saw that the broken num uh, the broken tackles and yards after contact were pretty good. I liked watching him play. I think he was – honestly, his comparison for me was like a Jamal Williams, but like a better runner just because he could be used in the passing game a little bit. I think that's what his role is going to be at the next level, just an in-between-the-tackles grinder that can be used on third downs when he's needed as a receiver. Obviously, the competition wasn't great in the AAC going up against UConn, who the over-under for every single game is like 95 and a half just because they can't stop anybody. But – you also got to realize, as Nick was talking about, their offensive line wasn't great. And sure, they're not going up against great competition. But when your offensive line isn't helping you and you're still able to produce despite that, uh, that's a big reason why I'm a fan of him. It's also the same reason I like Aker. So I just think he's a good, solid, all-around running back. It'll be interesting to see how he tests athletically because he's definitely not a fast guy. But I don't think he's you know, a 4'8 Elijah Holyfield type. Maybe he is, and then he's just completely off our boards. But he has a decent all-around skill set that – you know, maybe he's a late round flyer for you in the fourth round that not many people know about. And you could maybe get, you know, a few decent weeks if the starting running back on whatever team he gets drafted by goes down halfway through the season. Yeah, he's another guy like Zach Moss where it's it's an innocent until proven guilty. Like there's not much from a profile standpoint that I don't like. Once you get a little bit of context, like I said, you know, the yards after contact are very high relative to his yards per carry. Uh, his, pro his broken tackle rate was very good. It was like top 20 among 110 qualified running backs. So like he's elusive. He gets the yards after the contact. He's got the NFL workhorse size. He has the raw reception numbers. So until, like you said, he proves that he's, you know, very slow or not NFL ath athletic testing wise, like that's when I'll, I'll take a step back. So uh, like if it's between, you know, P Ryan's going to be probably higher rated than Michael Warren in most people's things. But like when I get to the third round, I'd much rather, uh, take a guy like Warren who might you know maybe it's one year of like uh, maybe not workhorse status but you know like top 18 ish numbers like I'd much rather take that yeah, yeah he kind of reminds me a little bit of Chris Carson too somebody who's probably gonna go late but is a pretty good you know I, I don't think necessarily a great athlete but size adjusted he could be he's a tough runner he can catch the ball I know Chris Carson isn't the best with his hands but they try to get him in that role if he finds a coach like Pete Carroll that just loves his late round his late round diamond that he found in the rough uh, he could, as you said, become like a top 18 running back if he gets a stranglehold of the job for one season. Yeah, yeah and he's got, he's got involvement in the passing game too. He's got 25 receptions and 21 receptions in the last two years. That's pretty damn good for college. And it's not like he's inefficient. You know, you average 9.3 yards per catch and 7.3 yards per catch. So, you know, again, you just want to find these guys in these late rounds. You want guys with versatility because they get more opportunities to get on the field, whether it's through pass catching, running, whatever it is. Um, so I'm with you guys on that one. Uh, it's going to come down to like landing spot. Whoever lands on like a better offense, basically, is like the guy I'm going to take a shot on. Hey, I'm going to cut you off real quick. Mike, we got you, uh, we got you up over 3,000 on Twitter. Oh, a word? Yeah. Oh, I got to give away that draft guide. Mr. 3001. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Noah, where are you at right now? You're like 80 away, right? Uh, yeah, Noah's close uh, too. All right, so let's, let's do a draft guide giveaway. Um, what have you guys been doing for rules-wise? 
we just choose them. But somebody just tweeted me saying that they're Mike's 3,000th follower. It's Fresh Baller, the guy that we didn't pick last time. So he just won that, it. Yeah. Fresh okay. Baller, you just won a draft guide, buddy. All right, we'll, yeah. give, away, we'll give away two draft guides. Uh, one for following both of them on Twitter, and then one just because we're good fucking people. But if you want to support the brand, you can go over to BigDogDraftGuide.com and grab it. We're going to be fucking – you'll have all of our rankings for the rookies. You'll have our uh, the rookie profiles. You'll have exclusive mock draft videos. Uh, we'll probably have some videos just like this on there. Uh, all the shit that's in the draft guide is going to be listed on the site. So go over to BigDogDraftGuide.com. You can support the boys over there. Um, just want to throw that in. I'm excited Mike got to 3,000. Thanks, that's boys. Like, Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Huge. Uh, Let's move to the next guy. I know that uh, Noah loves this dude. I know my boy at Ray GQ loves this guy. Darrington Evans. Why do you love him so much, Noah? Appalachian State. I'm pretty sure they only lost like one game this year, which is surprising. And they went up against South Carolina. I think they beat them. Actually, they did beat them because Brian Edwards dropped the pass at the end. But we'll, we'll, dim- <laughs> we'll dismiss that. Uh, I'll tell you what. Appalachian his- State has had that like fucking millennial swag ever since they beat Michigan back in the day. That was, like, oh, yeah. That's that right. was like the first big <laughs> upset that everyone who ever like watched college football was like super. You know, the whole world rallied around Appalachian State to beat Michigan. And since then, you, I think of that game when I think of Appalachian State. I'm just like, they just got so much swag because of that one win like 10 years ago. Yeah, well, Darrington Evans got swag because he's got a lot of versatility in his game. He was a kick returner for them. I think I already said it earlier. He scored a kick return touchdown every single year of his career. I was watching his highlights, and he actually scored an onside kick recovery touchdown. He had like three touchdowns in that game. Then they did an onside kick, and he took that one to the house too. He is an absolute beast. He is like 5'11", 200. So he's in that Marlon Mack type of like – he looks more like a receiver than a running back, but he's extremely fast. It looks like – at least he's got good burst on tape. The versatility and his ability to catch passes at least lends me to believe that if somebody's going to take a shot on him, they're going to want to use him as like not a Swiss Army knife, but somebody who can be used on special teams that will keep him on the roster and eventually work into a third down role and maybe eventually if an injury pops up, get himself a job as a first, second, and third down running back. And I just think he's going to test pretty well athletically. And, you know, if the draft capital is there somehow and his his profile – is good enough for me to believe that he could be a decent uh, NFL running back. Yeah, I mean, he's got 255 carries, so you know he can kind of handle that workload for about 1,500 yards, averaging 5.8 yards per carry. Again, doesn't really matter, but kind of probably speaks to the competition. He scored 23 touchdowns, 18 touchdowns on the ground, five tutties through the air, 21 receptions for 200 yards. So, like you said, man, this guy's versatile. That's why I like him. I like that you like him. I like that Ray likes him. I don't have time to look at film for Appalachian State, so I'm just going to trust <laughs> you guys. Um, and also, like, I mean, I don't know what I can add. Honestly, I'm not a film guy. So this is, like, in these types of areas, my advice to you is, like, find guys you trust. You know, find Noah, find Nick, find, like, Ray and whoever you I trust. trust me, Mike. Don't, yeah, find, just, don't find Mike, though. <laughs> yeah, don't find me, dude. Don't trust me because I, I don't know shit when it comes to film. I just look at what I want to look at. Um, and then, you know what? Just look at some of the film yourself. See, see if you see what you see, right? Like, I know – and when someone told me that AJ Dillon, AJ Dillon was good, I looked at the film, like, fuck that, um, ignoring that advice. I, th- but, yeah, I think the easiest way to go about, like, figuring out a prospect, again, is, is watch, like, two or three games. If you go on YouTube yeah. and just type in the player names and then type verse VS, you'll, the, you'll get, like, hand clips of just the plays that that guy was in. Watch two, two games. They're, like, five minutes each. You'll have an idea for what the player is and then jump into the numbers. Be like, okay, cool. We, he made, like, a couple big plays in a couple games. Then you go to his profile page and he had 300 yards on the year. You're like, okay, he did nothing else besides like those couple plays. You'll get a much better context of a player once you kind of work backwards that way. That's how I do it at least. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Uh, don't, don't look at highlights. Look at like the full game. Yes, so you can don't see ever look at highlights. I look at um, highlights after and if it's a good sign after. behind it, I tend to move them up my rankings, but that's yeah. more on the editor than anything. All right, <laughs> next up, wide receivers. Got a little bit more divergence here. Uh, and we'll cover Wait, can off we talk uh, about real quick. Are you guys not fans of Anthony McFarland? No, I haven't watched him play. Okay, I think he's really good. I think you guys maybe next time I come back on, we'll talk about him. But he's uh, it's it's Booger's son. The kids Oof. absolutely. He's what people think Salvin Ahmed is going to be. Anthony McFarland is an absolute stud. Well, I think Salvin Ahmed is nothing, so that doesn't help me. Well, other people, the public, <laughs> what the what the public thinks Ahmed is going to be is what Anthony McFarland is going to end up being. Yeah, I mean, I got McFarland right after, so they're kind of yeah. just in that same tier. But for me, uh, almost eight yards a carry when he when he came over to Maryland, his first year at Maryland, almost eight yards, and you're expecting this big jump in his second year, and he had the he had three 
baller games to start the season, and then he had the high ankle sprain. Then the high yeah. ankle sprain basically wiped out the next, you know, whatever, two months of the season for him. But yeah, he, regardless, he's explosive as fuck. He's going to run a really fast 40, I think, and he's going to be a playmaker in the NFL. Could be like that Justice Hill type thing? Is that, is that what you see in him? I, I think he's uh, – I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what he, like, weighs in at. I think he's going to be a smaller back. Uh, but, like, oh, my God. I think he'd be so good in – I mean, everyone would be good in, like, the Saints offense. But he's, uh, he can make plays on his own. And if, a, if there's a good coach, oh, my God, put him in San Francisco. Put him anywhere good. McFarland's a fucking baller. Put it that way. We'll talk more about him later. All right. I can't wait till he's on national television and Booger's talking about him. He's like, there's my son. I had sex with my wife and now he's out. <laughs> That's my son. <laughs> wait till yeah, wait till he goes in the sixth round and I can never talk about him again. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can talk about him. Freaking uh, what's his face? Darwin Thompson went in the sixth round. People took him in the sixth round of redraft leagues <laughs> last year. You love to see it. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're gonna move on to wide receivers here. Not going to focus too heavily on the top, other than the fact that you know that Noah and I freaking love Jalen Rager. He weighed in today at 205. BMI of like 29.5. This guy is thick. And he's big, super fast. big dub for the fans, yeah. Huge dub. I mean, if he lands in Philly, like, and like Lamb lands in like Buffalo, like, I'm going to have a hard time keeping Rager out of my wide receiver one. I'm going to put it Bro, there. Lamb is too good. Stop it. Dude, I'm going to have a hard time. But I'll just put it that way. I love both of them. We'll see what happens. Uh, but, yeah, that was a huge dub for the brand. And in terms of, like, where we diverge, I think one name that popped up for all three of us, and I'll kind of go to Nick first on this one, is Don't Denzel Mims. Denzel Mims. Uh, we right. have him as our wide receiver eight. ADP has him as the wide receiver 14. So that's a pretty big gap. And uh, all of us love him. So, But Nick had him the highest. So I'm going to go to you first. Uh, I'm going to start this off with a – Bold ass take right now. You ready? I Can think. I guess it. Hit it. Sure. Go. Is it? No. Does that have something to do with comparing him to T. Higgins? How did you know that? Because that's me. Also, I don't see a big difference between those two receivers. I was gonna Ooh. say Denzel Mims is gonna end up being what people want T. Higgins to be in the NFL. <laughs> I I see way wow. more like I see way more Mike Williams in T. Higgins than I see I see Denzel Mims as much. Stop. More like Stop it. Pause. Pause. <laughs> Cut me out. I'll go, I'll, go take, I'll go take a nap while you guys talk about why he's in tight end. I will not let you disrespect T. Higgins by comparing to Mike Williams on this Higgins, goddamn channel. T. Higgins is not, like he, his. I don't. He doesn't run routes. They just like run him. I feel like he's just big. He's great <laughs> at using his size to do the things that he's well at. But that's also what Mike Williams does. Yeah. Look, no Clemson receiver runs routes before they hit college. Or before they hit the NFL. Let's just put it that way. Okay. They, they're in the ACC. Uh, they're just really athletic, right? And. What I see in Higgins is he has really good body control. Like when I see him like jump over guys right. toward his body on the sidelines in the red zone, that's kind of where his strength lies. I totally agree. He's not polished, right? But no, I don't think any wide receiver that comes out of Clemson is polished. But he has a really good analytics profile. Again, I'm just aside from the film, he has a good breakout age, good dominator. And he was like actually really highly touted coming into college. He was one of the top rated wide receiver prospects he was like number one or top three or something like that so like recently i really do like you like seeing, do you like yeah i was gonna say do you because you could throw the the high school recruiting stuff out there and make a point either way because you'll see something no, you totally could you know he's really he was really high and then he like fell off or like vice versa and you know I, i'm just curious yeah. what your thought the, on the it. reason why i like it is the difference between him and someone like donovan people's jones is we don't know what the mentality is of these receivers coming into college right there's a ton of stuff going on ton of pressure you come in rated as like the top wide receiver recruit you go to a huge program all eyeballs are on you I would like to see how they translate in terms of like that pressure. I agree. T I like Higgins. The, I like high level at all at all levels. Yeah, T. Higgins was rated like top. He went into a top program and he performed. Like he performed on all the biggest stages. And like when people wrote him off for Justin Ross, what did he do? He came back this year and totally balled out and said like, "Yo, I'm still the top dog." Right. So, and from that perspective, I really do like to see him that way. But yeah, you know, that, well, we also spicy. the other thing we brought up. You said like the analytic profile is fantastic, but we you know we were talking about like the breakout age that player profiler had him listed at. And then PFF had him at like 19.9 player profile, 18.4 or something. So like be careful when you're looking around these numbers to justify what your analytical stance is on a player. So for D Higgins, the thing is if he did break out like closer to 20, it's a little, especially for a guy who's kind of on the fence about him already, it's a lot less appealing that way. So that's why I brought him up first too when we were talking about like things we're looking for for the combine. Again, if he comes out and runs, like I wouldn't be surprised if he runs kind of a shitty 40-yard dash. Like that wouldn't surprise me and uh, he'll move down my board pretty quickly. 
No, totally. I mean, like you can twist stats to say whatever you want to say. You can cut it off at whatever age you want to cut off at. I actually no, don't have him as no a one does it better profile. than us, baby. Um, I have him as a sophomore breakout, so nineteen year old breakout. So not elite, just very good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I cut you guys off, but like, what about? So you, I like that spicy take. What is it uh, about Mims? Like, what do you what do you guys see on film that kind of makes him jump off the page to you? I I see like a very similar player, but I see. Uh, more of like you know very long very lean frame very good body control pinpointing the ball in the air but when I look at those players I I question their ceiling like a Mike Williams like what can you do with the ball in your hands or what makes you different than a guy who's just going to catch it and fall down I feel like he has much better control over like his uh maybe like quick quick twitch fibers in a sense like he's more shifty to me he's a little more agile and I feel like that's a huge difference maker when you're talking about like when I when you watch him play he's so long but he doesn't you know he's not like slow with his movements you know I feel like he's, yeah he's a little quicker and he could do like comeback routes and he can make guys miss with the ball in his hands and everyone could do that in a sense but I don't know when I see the longer guys I'm like he needs to have some kind of uh, agility to him for me to really like him yeah to me as well it just seems like he's a little bit more like built for the NFL at this point I know he's a year older than T Higgins but he's extremely physical and I know I saw a few clips of him like in the run game in college and he just absolutely annihilates any DB that's trying to go after the running back He's just a big physical freak, and he has incredible hands. And what you were saying about T. Higgins with body control, I saw a lot of that with Mims as well. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure he dominated at the uh, Senior Bowl. There was a few clips of him down by the red zone, on, red zone, and I know you shouldn't weigh that too highly, but you know he's making some pretty incredible catches. He has the frame. He has a decent enough breakout age at 19.9, which is above the 60th percentile. He has a good uh, dominated rating. Uh, he's got a pretty good profile. He looks good on tape to me at least, so – yeah, he's and got that like uh, you know that trait in Madden, like a player. Some wide receivers had like the spectacular catch trait, and if you had that, you like only like a handful of guys can make crazy plays. It was like an AJ Green had that, and for some reason, if the ball was like legit seven yards above his head, he'd somehow <laughs> like do a double jump and go get it. Like him and T Higgins, both I wrote that down. I legit was like quotation spectacular catch trait. Both of them have just and, and Jalen Rager, and like those guys have just unbelievable. You know, this is like intangible to them where it's like the ball is in the air and they're going to get it. And you're going to be like, holy shit, how do you make that play? So I like both of them from that point. For me, it's just like, what what extra do you do besides be a great wide receiver at the point of catch? Yeah, and some guys just don't have that. Some guys just aren't innately ag aggressive. They're not going to go up and pinpoint a ball. And we've seen that out of Denzel Mims. We've seen that out of T. Higgins and Jalen Rager. That's a, that's a trait that I know, Mike, also, like when you talk about wide receivers dropping passes, it's different when you drop a pass on the outside instead of on the inside when you're surrounded by a bunch of DBs or linebackers, it's a, it's a mentality thing. And you can't really take that away from a receiver, whether that like, I know it's corny and cliche, but like if you want the ball more than the defender wants the ball, you go up and get it. And that's exactly what Denzel Mims and you Higgins and Rager have shown. <laughs> Yeah, dude, I totally agree with you guys. I had my comp, and you know, I wrote him up for the Big Dog's Guide, and I had him comp to Marvin Jones Jr. That's kind of who he reminded me of. I like that a lot. That's a great comp. Yeah, and in terms of analytics, he actually smashes it too. I mean, he broke out hitting a 33% dominator as a, uh, as a sophomore, which is excellent. He took a huge dip in his second year. He dropped to like 20%. Uh, market share receiving yards but had 48 percent of the team's td so again that just goes to show this guy's an absolute fucking monster in the red zone and then he bounced back in the in the senior year which you want to see i think that's probably why he went back he had a down year in his junior year proved on a senior year not a not a kiss of death by any means uh, i prefer to see them come out but if he goes back and improves that also works and i think you know we talked about this before i don't give a shit about the senior bowl because very few relevant guys come out of the senior bowl but someone like mims who dominated the route that's actually like a pretty good sign. It's right? like, like the combine in a sense too. It's like it also, you know, uh, if someone comes in there and you're not sure about them, they didn't play against a level of competition that power five guys did or a guy from the SEC did and they're a smaller school player and then just get absolutely dominated. It's the same thing as a running back running a four eight five. It's like, yes, we don't really know how good you're going to be, but we could tell you're not as good as the relative players to you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So big dog stamp of approval. We're obviously a higher on him than most, but uh, I think, you know, where you guys, where are you guys willing to take him? Like, Second round, mid-second round? Probably mid-second round. It all depends on landing spot and draft capital, but I assume he's going to be a day two or earlier pick, just what he's shown, especially with those you know, scouts loving him at the senior bowl. He's probably going to do decently at the combine. So if he lands in a good spot and he has a draft capital, I'm fine taking him mid-second. All yeah. right. I think that's probably around where I'm looking at him too. Sweet. Next up, uh, Big Dog's non-favorite, Henry Ruggs. So, you know, as you know, we're obviously going to be lower on him than consensus because – other people overrated speed, but you know what? He's still going to get drafted high, right? So we have him as the wide receiver nine. 
the consensus has him as the wide receiver six. Uh, I mean, I've kind of spoken on this a lot. It's just that it's very rare for a wide receiver who doesn't break out to actually have long-term success in the NFL, regardless of how fast they are. And people love to use the Tyreek Hill comp. Um, but the thing is, like, Tyreek Hill wasn't a wide receiver, right? So there's a reason why he didn't break out. Yeah, Ruggs Julian has played... Edelman, they, they were saying uh, Julian Edelman had, like, more... Uh, more like defensive touchdowns than receptions in college. Or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like crazy. Yeah. Stats. I don't know. Yeah. So like, it's hard for me to like justify rugs by using those guys as comps. Um, but at the end of the day, like he's going to be really fast and he has 10 and what one eighth inch hands. He's got big ass hands, uh, low BMI. So I guess from an analytics perspective, those cancel out, but you know, what do you guys see? I think Noah has him the lowest out of both of us. Noah's got him at wide receiver 10 and me and Nick have him at wide receiver eight. He's yeah, not he's, a guy I'm avoiding. He's not like, I'll be fine if he, if he drops my team at like a decent value or whatever. He's definitely not a guy I'm avoiding. But again, like, you know, with the, going back to the never breaking out, the problem with that, like people in the audience, I don't want you to be like, oh my God, no breakout. That's too analytical. Like the, the problem with not having a breakout is, is that breaking out just means you produce at the college level. If you, if you didn't produce at the college level, you're probably just not that good at football. That's the problem with it, right? Like if you're good at football, you put up stats while you're playing football, right? And if you didn't do that, then what, if you didn't do it at college, why the fuck would you be able to do it at the NFL <laughs> when the elite of the elite players from college are the ones that you're playing against now? So that was that, that's my point on that. But, I mean, Ruggs, yes, you could pinpoint very good plays he has, and he's going to have elite, elite speed when he runs a 40, um, which is going to be fun to watch because I think probably a lot, of, a lot of people putting down a lot of money on him. Um, there's rumors that he might, you know, flirt with uh, the low four twos. We'll we'll see what comes of it. But again, I don't know. I, I like could he is the realm of possibilities like Deshaun Jackson? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you know none of us can sit here and say it confidently one way or another. So Rugs not a guy I'm completely fading. Um, there are guys in this draft that I will be, but he's he's not one of them. I'm just not super high on him. Yeah, I think he's just gonna be a lot more expensive than what I'm willing to pay for him. I mean, when it's all said and done, he's gonna be you know a mid to late first round rookie pick. And me yeah, ranking that. him as low as I have him isn't me saying that I hate the guy. It's just I'd rather have nine other receivers at this point ahead of him, which means I'm not going to be able to draft him. So yeah, it, I just, it, along with what you guys said, him never breaking out and there always being like three to four other guys on the team just outproducing him, whether it be like a running back in Najee Harris or Jerry Judy, Devonta Smith, Jalen Waddell. Like he never cemented himself as the number one or the number two or the number three in that offense. So I don't know. I'm not buying into the hype. And a lot of tape guys do seem to love him. When I watch him play, it's like he has big playability, but I don't see him bringing any type of consistency fantasy wise uh, in any other aspects of the game other than like a broken play know, touchdown. You want to know what the problem is? It's every time you try to watch a wide receiver uh, from Alabama, Devontae Smith is just there to dominate. <laughs> I can't. I was watching fucking Jerry, Jerry Judy film today, and I feel like I was watching a Devontae Smith highlight tape. It was ridiculous. Yeah, and there was one, one game, game where Judy put up good stats, and I went to go watch that one, and then Devonta Smith had, like, four touchdowns in that game. I'm like, who Dude, I'm not even watch? kidding. Like, this kid was unbelievable. But <laughs> that's, that's the problem. It's like when you're on Alabama, you have all this unbelievable talent. It's like, did he not produce because of that? Or, like, at, at some point you have to be like, Dude, if you're good enough to play at a high level in the NFL, like you need to demand more than four targets a game at the college level. I, I mean, here's my thing with Ruggs, right? Like the competition argument. Like I get it. Like intuitively, it does make sense. Correct. But then at the same time, like if you have wide receivers that get on your team and they're drawing the other team's best defenders, you're getting the third cornerback. You should be dusting that guy like every single play, right? And if you're open to it, it's going to hit you. So I think like I think the teammate thing kind of works both ways. Like you can't like. You can't just like say it's bad one way and good another way. So that's that's my take on that. Enough on rugs. We hit on him enough here. And what's that guy? That one guy that watches that loves rugs and keep Bush. talking about. Yeah, Bush is gonna, <laughs> gonna hit on guys for us just taking a shit on rugs all the time. Shout but, out, yeah. Shout out to uh, is he the one with the Twitter Abby that has like the Cardinals jersey? Maybe he like met up with uh sexy, sexy pass. Yeah, that's yeah. what I was actually gonna bring up. They were sending fucking pictures in our group media. <laughs> Two big dogs. Someone went up on stage. They were at a bar in Canada. This kid that's in one of our dynasty leagues, and he was like, oh, I'm, I'm sexy Pats." And another kid that was at the bar came up. He was like, "Yo, you're a fan of big dogs or whatever." And then they like linked up and started sending us selfies and shit. It was ridiculous. So fuck you guys. <laughs> to be honest. Global. Yeah. <laughs> uh, last wide receiver we're gonna talk about. Lynn Bowden Jr., this is my dude. Uh, I'm going to probably stand for him until the combine. I think he's actually going to test really well in the combine. He's pretty athletic. And what I love about him and his, his craft is that he's super versatile. So 
get, get a load of this. Okay. So as a sophomore, he actually broke out. He had hit a 33% mark share receiving yards, 35% uh, receiving TD. So he actually broke out as a wide receiver, uh, 745 yards, 11.1 yards per catch. And then basically in his senior year, he decided uh, I'm going to be the quarterback as well as the running back. So he combined for 1800 rushing and receiving yards, just ridiculous. Jeez. 13 TDs also had 400%, uh, 400 passing yards, and he accounted for 43% of the team's total offensive yards. So he literally put Kentucky on his goddamn back and just carried them through. And I just, I'm just like so excited to see what he does at the next level. And his landing spot is going to be so important, right? If he lands on like the 49ers, like you said, in the Kyle Shanahan system that gets him the ball in space and runs him out of the Wildcat, um, I think he's going to be really exciting, right? Like, I think if anything, he has what, a what position is he going to play at the next level wide receiver uh so i he's he's listed as a wide receiver uh okay. but like he's going to be like wide receiver running back that's how i see him like he's going to be like percy harvin that that's kind of what i think about when it comes okay. to Lynn Bowden jr like this man actually like he had three games of over 200 yards or two plus tts like that's just actually ridiculous right like a game against louisville probably a signature game he had 284 yards and four touchdowns and he won the uh the horning award which is basically awarded to like the nation's most versatile player. So past winners of that include CMC, Barkley, OBJ, my 2021 wide receiver too, Rondell Moore. So I just love seeing guys like this because they get on the field, right? And at this stage of the draft in that like low second, early third round, you just want to see guys that get opportunity. That's why I love Lindon Jr. Yeah, yeah you so he's another landing spot depending because... guy, right? Yeah. Okay. I don't, know who the, I don't know who the fuck he is to be honest. So I'm just kind of soaking this in from you guys. Yeah, I was going to say, he also returned kicks and punts. He had two punt return touchdowns in 2018. And even this year, when he took over the, the helm as a quarterback, he was still returning kicks. He's just, he's electric. That's the only way to describe him. And whatever, like, an NFL team wants to use him as in the NFL, he's going to produce. Because he's not just, like, a Swiss Army knife that's decent at a bunch of things. He's, like, a really good receiver. He's great in open space. So, uh, just to say he's only versatile, not that I'm saying that you sold him short, Mike, but I think he's just a really good football so... player. He showed that. So when the Saints let Taysom Hill walk, they're going to draft him and use him as the next Taysom Hill? 100%. That'd be sick. He's he's a way better Taysom Hill. Okay. Yeah. We just figured out the comp. Yep. Um, so that kind of wraps up for wide receivers. Uh, anything you guys want to touch on before we move on to tight ends? No, we had like Duvernay and Ayuk, but I think we touched on them a little bit. It's just yeah. preference. Run it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so tight end rankings, no, we'll throw this up. But this is kind of where we differ a lot from consensus. And I think what it comes down to is, you know, I think people think about tight ends like in a vacuum from like an NFL perspective, but I think about it from like a fantasy perspective, right? Just because a tight end is a complete blocker and all that stuff. Like I really just don't give a shit because I just care about how many points they score on the field. So I care about how good they are as a pass catcher. And if they're running routes, like are they on the field? It's like, actually look, absurd to the level of like shit I don't care about when I'm watching tape on like running backs and tight ends and wide receivers. There's so many plays I'm just hitting the, the right arrow key. I'm like, oh, he's blocking on this play. Arrow, 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 arrow. Because <laughs> you, you look at fucking like any profile right up. I go to like the draft network and every guy is like, oh, he's a willing blocker. He's a willing inline blocker. I'm just like, I already know what they're going to say. It doesn't fucking matter, honestly. Just, just show me, show me how fast you are. That's all I can yeah. Say. So we got Big Dog's favorite, Adam Troutman. Nick and Noah both have him as the tight end one. So, Nick, I remember we were talking about this a little bit, but why don't you uh, give the audience a little insight into why he's your tight end one? Uh, well, when I started watching his film, I thought I was watching Adam Thielen, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was just, he's just this big white guy who fucking makes plays in, in the receiving game. Um, like it, it, he's on another level of everyone on the field, which makes sense considering he goes to Dayton and the level of competition is obviously a lot lower. But – uh, the production he put up just – I mean, you watch him and you don't think of him as a tight end. He, I'm not kidding. Like, the skill set is is very uh, reminiscent of Adam Thielen. They're, I mean, they're, they're, I think they both – is Adam Thielen 84? Years old or what? <laughs> yes, uh, yes, is Adam Thielen 84 years old? No, his number. Uh, it's, I think it's – I don't even know. Let me look this up. Okay, I think I might have just completely – I'm going to say 17, up. but I know that's wrong. Oh, that actually uh, – I don't know. Either way. Um, 19. What is it? 19. Oh, why the fuck did I think he was 84? Uh, well, le legit, they look like the same on the field. I mean, this kid is, uh, for his size, what do, you, what do you come in today at, like 6'5", 250? 6 256 or 253. Yeah, he should not move the way he moves for that size. And I know, like, every year I feel like this is, like, the typical tight end talk, but this kid is 
uh, much more of a receiver than a tight end. And him going to the small school, everything is going to come down to where he gets drafted because the NFL could just look at this kid and just be like, ah, he's another small school you know, tight end. We're, we're going to take him in the fourth or fifth round, which is going to absolutely kill his fantasy stock. But if he goes anywhere within the first two days, um, you know, and fucking Yahoo doesn't put him in as, as a wide receiver on their, on their platform, then he should be your tight end one. You yeah, could probably it, talk to him more, more uh, analytically. I haven't dove into too many of the tight ends, but from what I saw on film, he's an absolute problem. If Dayton had better camera equipment, he would be the consensus <laughs> number one tight end because you watch this guy play, and it's like somebody was recording from like you know hunters have those scopes that like zoom in for two miles. That's it's basically- like it's like the difference between our three screens right now. Yeah, like <laughs> first yours. Nick is Troutman, and me and Mike are like every other prospect. <laughs> no, switch that. Whatever. You guys uh, are yeah. Troutman. I'm fucking LSU. <laughs> I'm I'm SEC tight ends. You're Dayton. <laughs> Uh, I was just talking about the zoomed in, but whatever. Uh, Troutman, yeah, just oh. echo- <laughs> echoing, <about> quality. <laughs> echoing everything Nick said. Just like I put out a clip of him on Twitter. He was like getting double teamed and he just ran a pretty nice route. And I know it's subjective, but he just like put two guys on skates, made a contested catch and dragged them into the end zone. I know he's going up against like terrible competition, but from everything I heard, he dominated at the senior bowl. He seems to be fairly athletic. All he needs really is draft capital for me to solidify him as the tight end one, which I have him right now. I just think he's a great receiver. He seems, you know, athletic. And I'm not so sure blocking-wise, I'm not so sure that Dayton even wanted to run the ball with him on the field. So I think that'll all come to fruition when we see where he gets picked in the NFL draft. Yeah, I love Drummond too. I mean, anyone that puts up 500, 600, 900 yards as a tight end in college, you got my attention. So, um, and again, like the small school thing is, is a little bit of a knock and it's the reason why I have him third behind the other two guys. But uh, I think, you know, that's definitely not a kiss of death, right? You think about guys like Dallas Goddard, like, you know, Gerald Everett, John Smith, some of these Adam guys. Adam Shaheen, are yeah, all of Yeah, guys. I mean, yeah. 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 <laughs> you, look for, <laughs> you look for tight ends with athleticism. For so the most part, it's not uh, – I, I feel like tight ends are always so, like, raw. I mean, they always talk about how, like, they come from a basketball background, but I feel like to succeed as a receiving tight end, you really just have to be a very good athlete because it's not like you consistently need to beat press coverage. You're going against the worst athletes on the other side of the ball and in the, in the linebackers and – I mean, not the safeties aren't bad athletes, but in terms of just like straight coverage, you don't have to be as good as a wide receiver. So as long as you're athletic, you're fast, you could stretch the seam, like you're going to do fine. So it doesn't really matter what school you went to. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, we got another small school guy. Uh, we all got him at number two, actually. Harrison Bryant plays for Florida Atlantic. So Devin Singletary's uh, former teammate. Again, I'll just run through the numbers real quick before you guys get into the film. But another guy that put up a thousand yards, put up a thousand yards as a tight end in college, you have my attention. So but aside from that, like he was super efficient, right? Pro football focus had his 2019 mark of 3.04 yards per route run, which is one of the top efficiency metrics when it comes to receivers as the best ever recorded in pro football focus college era. And he had a 2018 season, which ranked sixth best all time. And he had three top 20 graded seasons by pro football focus that no other tight end hit that mark more than twice. So from an analytics perspective, like this guy's way up there, you know, he's got, He's got the size, and when I saw him on tape, at least, he, he looked more receiver than blocker to me. But, again, I, don't, I just don't care. If you catch passes and give me fantasy points, that's what I care about most. What do you guys see uh, when, you, when you watch him on film? Noah, I'll come to you first. Yeah, he's just a good receiver, like you said. He could be used basic, basically as a wide receiver in a bigger body. He's good after the catch. I saw a few plays of him just watching his film where he just runs over the middle, linebacker hits him, he bounces off of him like a pinball, and he just keeps going. I think he's going to be a pretty good athlete. He reminds me a little bit of Tyler Higby, and I know Higby was basically brought into this league to block a little bit, but he was also a very good receiver coming out of college. And then what we saw this past year out of him being decent after the catch and just being a trusted weapon of Jared Goff, I could see that with Harrison Bryant just being a big-bodied receiver who's going to dominate around the end zone, can win after the catch, can win at the catch point. Just these top three, I, for me at least, they're like in a tier of their own. And I just think that they can do it all in the receiving game. Choosing between them is really splitting hairs. Uh, To say I chose Harrison Bryant over Hunter Bryant because of his size is probably the truth. Um, But also his numbers show that he was very efficient, as you just brought up, in college throughout every single year he was was at FAU. And he had NFL talent on his team competing for targets and, you know, opportunity with him. Dude, 1,000 receiving yards. How many tight ends in the history of the NCAA have ever posted 1,000 receiving yards? It's a good question. I don't know, man. It can't be more than, like, 20, I'd say. So, yeah, you put up 1,000 receiving yards as a tight end – you absolutely have my attention. And if you look at the analytics, the ba- you know, the very basic numbers that 
people like to target breakout age in the 91st percentile college dominator in the 80th percentile. So from a, from a, a pure profile production and, um, you know, the breakout age and things like that. I mean, there's no red flags here. Again, we'll have to see draft capital. We'll have to see athleticism, but um, he's a guy that can step right in and, and be a receiving problem in, in the NFL. So yeah, Harrison Bryant, tight end. Definitely. Uh, next up, we got the third tight end for big dogs. My tight end one, uh, Hunter Bryant. And I'll just go real quick into him as well. And so yeah, he's like the first one. He's the first big school guy. And I get it. Like, I think the one knock against him is his size. I think he's about 6'1". But when I watched this guy play, he was being used, like, all over the field. He was lining up in the slot, lining up out wide, lining up in line. He's just a, he's just a playmaker. And as a freshman, okay, as a freshman, he was second on his team in receiving yards behind, I think, Dante Pettis it was. And also they had Will Disley at Washington. So, again, he's competing with NFL talent. He's getting on the field. He's doing it, he's doing it big. From an efficiency perspective – 2.71 yards per route run in 2019. That's the best by any tight end in a Power 5 conference ever recorded by Pro Football Focus. His career 2.9 yards per route run and 11.6 yards per target makes him the leader of the position. So he's best in the class from an efficiency perspective. And again, like I just want to see how these guys translate as receivers because if they get on the field and they, if they're catching passes when the quarterback is dropping back to pass, that's really all I care about. And if he develops into a competent blocker, great. If he doesn't, whatever. And in terms of being a playmaker, like this guy was breaking tackles a lot. Like every time I tried on the film, it seemed like he was either drooking out a linebacker or just shedding off a DB. He had 0.21 tackles forced per reception, which is fourth best in the class, and 3.7 yards after contact. So seven best in the class. So I think he's a total package when it comes to a fantasy tight end. He might not be that for an NFL tight end, but, and I think he's going to test really well. So if he goes in like the second round, this guy's going to be locked in as my tight end one. Two things. He's, he's only 20 years old. So he's very young still Two, Have you seen his picture on player profiler? <laughs> yeah. He looks like multiple crackheads that live on my block. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not kidding, bro. He looks out of control there. So that's uh, a, a little bit of a concern for me. He might have a drug, <laughs> might have a drug history. So NFL teams will probably sniff that out quickly. Jesus Christ. I just opened <laughs> yeah, it up. Right? Dude, he looks like those troll dolls where you like pull their hair. And <laughs> yeah, in one yeah. direction. That's funny. Someone just tagged me on Twitter. There's like a video. <clears throat> of someone in a suit like helping his girl get ready on the on the red carpet and someone quote tweeted and said like derrick henry's winning on and off the field like meaning that that was derrick henry fixing his girl because the girl's really hot and curvy and then someone tagged me in it of course like pissed me off and someone underneath was like that's offset <laughs> like, it's, it's so funny it probably didn't make sense when i just said it out loud but it made sense to me all right back to the crackhead hunter brian um yeah, Mike, that was a good breakdown. I agree. Great guy. Great guy. Great prospect. <laughs> yeah, That's after seeing that picture, he might move down my board. But yeah, he's good after the catch. He's, as you said, you don't have to be on the field all the time to be a good fantasy tight end. As long as when you're on the field, you're being used and whatever team drafts him is going to use him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the last guy we'll just cover briefly, Cole Komet. He's probably your typical, you know, big inline blocker, more complete tight end. So I'm sure that, you know, he's he's got the ADP of a tight Mike, end. You could, you could say white. It's okay. <laughs> say what? <laughs> oh, yeah. Say white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a uh, Caucasian. So um, your typical but, Kyle Rudolph of the draft class. <laughs> yeah. When Nick yeah, was exactly. talking about pressing the right arrow on every video, he's actually never seen a Cole Komet play because he's just skipped through every single one because that's all he does. <laughs> Do you just block all the time? <laughs> he's a no, he's, receiver, but he's like he moves like a I don't like the Titanic. He's just like super slow, but he's like big. <laughs> yeah, look, I mean, he, he's he's very realistically probably the tight end one in the class from an NFL perspective. But just from a fantasy perspective, I got the other guys ahead of him. It's not like we hate him; it's just that we got the other guys ahead of him. So yeah, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I hate his guts. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that wraps it up for our rankings. Um, honestly, these rankings are probably meaningless anyways, because after the combine, we're going to update them. Uh, and, then, watching, yeah. <laughs> and after the draft, we're going to update them again, because obviously draft capital and landing spot matter the most. But, you know, it kind of gives you a little bit of insight. I, I personally like to track this stuff because it forces me to kind of get a look into the players and kind of see how they move and how people value them over time. So it's pretty useful mm -hmm. from that perspective. But, you know, we just wasted an hour of your time talking about rankings are going to be updated. So don't hate us for it. Yeah, this actually helped me a lot because if I wasn't coming onto the show, I, there would have been like 11 players that I have no idea who the fuck they are still right now. And I should I should have a much better grasp on what's going on with the rookies, but uh, 
but now I, I do. You watch a bunch of tape, like it all just gets mixed in, and you see a bunch of numbers, and you think Harrison Bryant's Hunter Bryant, and then all these guys just <laughs> well, become. That's, one that's why I was saying, like, it's our job to make sure everyone like understands the theme of the player, and then once you kind of understand each player from a very top level view, then you could start breaking down the context. Because even for us, like who are in in this stuff, like every single day, looking at the numbers, looking at the tape, it's very hard. Because I mean, we just have like a a new sixty to seventy players just thrown onto us, right? And uh, most of them are going to be irrelevant soon. So it's like sort of like losing a little bit of steam when you're watching guys who aren't even good. You're like, fuck, I got to watch this guy who looks like this guy who looks like this guy. And, you know, it gets lost on you. So the um, best thing to do is just, I, I would say, do a little research on your own if you're really interested in it. Otherwise, come back to us, grab the draft guide because we will have all of our rankings in there. Once uh, I think April 1st is going to be the launch date. There will be plenty of value in there. It's like $13 right now on, on the website, bigdogsdraftguide.com. Uh, any parting words? Uh, well, I mean, we're going to hit up the narrative real quick, um, before we, before we exit, but I'll stop pretending like I run this thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Shut shut your mouth. Uh, Uh, the narrative this week, oh wait, should I hit the intro first? I guess we already hit it. It's been hit. Okay, cool. The narrative, the, the narrative this week is don't sell your rookie draft picks until you're on the clock. You know, I have my own thoughts about this, but I'm going to kick it over to Noah first to see what he thinks. Yeah, I don't think you should wait necessarily until you're on the clock. I just think that rookie draft picks definitely accrue value from right now until the draft. Because first off, we have the combine where, as we just spent like an hour and a half talking about, we don't weigh it too highly. But a lot of people in your league are probably going to see a bunch of guys who they didn't have high, highly ranked in the first place run really fast or run, you know, or jump really high, going to move them up their ranks. And let's say T. Higgins runs a 4-6. Sure, that might move him down your boards, but you're still Shut your goddamn him. mouth, dude. Stop freaking slandering <laughs> T. Higgins. 4.88 4. 4. 8. 4. 8. 8. T. Higgins. <laughs> <laughs> titty, like, titty boy Higgins. <laughs> 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 sorry go on <laughs> but as a guy like Ayuk and Duvernay and those guys run four fours maybe even four threes they move up boards so those late seconds early seconds mid seconds whatever they start to gain value because people want these athletic freaks and then as the draft rolls around guys like Terry McLaurin and Mecole Hardman they got picked in the second round that weren't being valued so high all of a sudden become valued and guys that were eventually that were in the first place being second round picks moving to the third and those that wanted them in the second will still want them in the third so those thirds gain value basically if you're selling picks now you're selling them in my opinion at their lowest price when you're on the clock I feel like it's hard to move picks because people will then see oh I don't even like any of these guys I'll just wait until pick like you'll be on the clock at like pick 108 you'll be like oh I picked 201 there's gonna be a guy like equally as much so it might be hard to move your pick at that point I think one of the best times to do is just after the draft when we know situations are ironed out. And even last year with A.J. Brown, who landed in a bad situation, people still wanted to draft him because he's A.J. Brown. And then J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, who people were lower on, landed in Philly, which was a good landing spot. And people were like, I want to draft him because he's in a good landing spot. So uh, a lot of things uh, get ironed out after the draft, and those picks accrue value. And if you want to move them, uh, just wait a few months. I know it's hard in Dynasty to be patient, but that's the name of the game, and that's how you're going to get the most value out of what you have. I also think it's important to differentiate. I don't think a lot of people do it this way, but some people might have fast rookie drafts, right? As opposed to like an email or a slow rookie draft. And that of course means you almost have no chance of selling rookie draft picks. So anything we're saying right now about selling during a draft, if you have a fast draft where it's like a two or even like a four minute clock, it's going to be very difficult. But if you're in an email draft where it's like eight hours or even four hours between the picks, I like the idea of selling during the draft pick. The best thing about fantasy football is the fact that everyone has their own opinions on a player. So no matter where you are in a draft, one of your 11 teammates is going to really like someone on the board. So you might be at a spot where it's like the 206, you have the 206, and you're not really a fan of the value of anyone on the board. There is going to be someone out there that really likes – Yo, are we good? Yeah. Your video froze. You froze, but we can still hear you. Uh, Yeah, my shit just froze. Hold on I was about to fucking drop something legendary right there. <laughs> You're about a milli rack. I, I can tell. I can tell by your yeah, hand. Yeah. Uh, are you? Is are your guys' video still going? You can hear my. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, we bike. Yeah. Who's got the good camera now? Hey. Hey. <laughs> um. So wow, your shit just fast forwarded. Oh my god, my video's going. Okay. Okay. Uh, back to what I was saying. Yeah. So if you're on the clock and you don't like a guy, and you have time to you know finesse a trade or whatever, just th- be like my you know my picks on the block and see what's out there. 
because there's going to be someone that really likes one or two of the players on the board and you could usually end up pumping value out of that. So I'm a fan of trading during, I mean, I'm, I'm really a fan of trading um, anytime throughout the process, whether it's before, whether it's after, whether it's after the NFL draft, I feel like gets a little bit tricky selling afterwards because everybody starts to get a really clear value of the tiers that are being picked. You know, once the NFL draft drops, then everyone, a lot of people in the community like have the same rankings and same tiers and stuff. So you know about where you can get a player, but before the NFL draft, even before the combine and shit, like shit is just so up in the air. Cause you don't know, like this guy who's the RB fucking 10 might come up to RB three and, and like vice versa. So it's like, you have a lot of option, I think to, to fuck around with the value. Yeah, I totally agree with you guys. I think the one thing I'll say is it comes always comes down to like understanding your league, right? So I'm in leagues right. with, you know, casuals. I'm in leagues with industry vets. And like given the hype of where 2020 is, you have like guys like Swift and JT going in the top two rounds of startups. Like how much more can they really go up? Not very much. Um, so I'm open to trading. But I will say you should at least wait till after the combine because that's kind of when you see like, you know, some of these like testing come out and you kind of eliminate some of those like dog, you know, really, really slow, like running backs and wide receivers. And like if T. Higgins, shut your goddamn mouth. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I was going to say, you pissed me off. I forgot my point. Oh, no, no. Here, here we go. Uh, I, I will say I'm open to trading when you're making trade for studs. So like what I did is I had the 1.01 in one of my leagues and I already moved it because I moved him for Joe Mixon. And like between now and the draft, like, that value isn't really going to change much because Joe Mixon's like a top, you know, consensus top eight, like running back. Bro, I've so, been thinking about making that move. I've been thinking about uh, moving Mixon for one of the top picks. Yeah, Mixon, exactly. But, but like, you're not going to give like, come the draft time, you're not going to give like a first and a second for Mixon, right? Like that price, when you're trading for studs at that level, you're kind of already locked in that value. Yeah. Right? No, I was more, thinking about giving up Mixon like four in return and getting picks in return. I don't know. Mixon scares me. I love, I know this is like completely fucking off kilter and this is just like very specific player analysis, but uh, sorry, go on. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I made that move and, you know, guys can go out, make moves for like Alvin Kamara, like Zeke and all that stuff. I think where you want to hold really is in that back part of the first, because it's not yet defined, like what players are going to be there. And you're going to be able to get a lot of value for veterans like Landry, Robert Woods, like guys that are basically going to produce for you right away by selling that rookie pick when you're close to the draft. And the other thing is like, if you wait all the way till you're on the clock and you're selling, like people know like that you don't want it. Right. So you kind of lose a little bit of negotiating leverage. So I think that you should try and sell it before the draft actually starts. Um, to try and get you know some of that value, but that's just kind of like my personal approach. But again, it just comes down to knowing your league. Yeah, I think if you're in a very trade happy league, you'll probably be able to get people looking to do it during the. I mean, if you're if you're in any league with with Yannick or Scott, yeah. and <laughs> considering you're whoever's watching this is in the big dog community, you're absolutely have you have to be in a league with one of them. And if you're not, <laughs> we still have that Slack channel still going, right? Yeah. Yeah, so if you guys want to, uh, I want you to plug that a little bit because we have a Slack channel. It's completely free for y'all to join, and it's a way for uh, people in our audience to join Dynasty Leagues with other people in the audience. Yeah, and in the description of every Dynasty video we put out, I'll put the invite to the Slack channel. It's completely free. There's like 20 different channels, whether it be learning league rules, how to join a league, where to put your money in a third party so you don't get scammed by one of these frauds that follows <laughs> us. Uh, I think we have six leagues set up right now, which is pretty good. It's you know, 72 people Very that good. wanted to start a league. Mike and I are going to co-manage a league through there. And we also have a, a channel in there where it's roster feedback and trade review, where Mike and I eventually, when you guys draft your teams in those leagues, we're going to go through and see moves you guys have made, critique it, critique your roster. It's, it's basically for not, not just beginners, but it's a good place to start if you don't know how to start a, a dynasty league and you want a committed group of guys. Uh, we're going to be in there chatting with you guys, talking about rookie picks. So uh, it, it's just, you know, it's like a one-stop shop for dynasty. Some good uh, then, old fashioned fun with the fucking boys. Yeah. Just a big forum yeah, yeah. with the big dogs. Yeah. Before we leave, I think uh, let's give the viewers one tip. You know, we talked about trading while you're on the clock. What is one move that you're going to be looking to make when you're on the clock? So I'll just give mine real quick. If I'm at the back half of the second or the top part of the third and people are taking guys like Lamico P Ryan, Michael Warren, all these like backup running backs, I'm going to try and flip that pick for Tony Pollard. That's going to be my number one go-to move when I'm on the clock. I like that. I don't have anything off the top of my head. I wish I had read the show sheet. <laughs> I, there's no show sheet. I just spitball off the top of my head. Oh, I'm not prepared for rookie draft. So uh, I, th I think what I'm going to do is, uh, is, is send this 
over to Noah to answer. Yeah. One guy I'm super high on is Christian Kirk. If I have a late first and somebody is trying to give up Christian Kirk and I can sell like a 110 to 112, even up to like 109, 108, I feel like I'd rather just have Christian Kirk because he's almost as young as any of these guys. We know his situation. We know he's good. He's just been hurt. And, you know, he's gone through terrible quarterback play and a first year coach. So he's somebody that I like. He's got a great profile. We talked about him last week. Um, but yeah, I'll just, Tony I'll Pollard piggy- as well. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that. I think it's a great idea to so, – because virtually what you're doing, if you if you give up a back half of the first – so the back half of the first is almost exclusively these wide receivers that people like. So what you're doing is giving up the wide, the rookie wide receiver. It's about to be a rookie for Christian Kirk, who people probably drafted at the back half of the first round. But you're eliminating those like first two years where a lot of receivers don't get that elite-level production, right? They're still kind of acclimating themselves to the league. So you got to skip the rookie year kind of dip in production you got to skip the sophomore year which is sometimes a breakout year but it didn't happen for Kirk so you're getting the two shitty years out of the way so if you think Kirk is going to break out like you've already gotten rid of the the two years that he wasn't going to break out and so in a sense you're skipping the first two dip years for the rookie that you're about to pick anyways for a guy like Christian Kirk so that kind of goes oh, yeah. with any that kind of goes with any like second or third year wide receiver just from a general strategy standpoint yep all right well we're going to continue with the big dog draft guide giveaways follow me follow noah you probably only follow nick but if you don't definitely follow him too and uh (laughs) or unfollow him and just basically you know tell us something you like about the show give us advice to improve we're always listening and again we're just going to pick the winner based on uh, who we like so (laughs) hit us up (laughs) i want to enter (laughs) yeah so anyways that's our show for the week and next week we'll be hitting you back with the winners and losers from the combine and probably give you an update uh, of our ranks so look out for that as well Love you. What's happening, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Noah, and if you couldn't tell, this is Bunk Bed Breakdown. Hold up, hold up. Please. Hold up. <laughs> Where did that fucking start? Were you reading that intro off a of script? <laughs> I wasn't. That's just what I've been doing. That was the most monotone bullshit I've ever heard. <laughs>